welcome everyone i am indrajit i am an mcc from icf and also master certified coach from marshall goldsmith i represent gromo revenues we have our team here gorima and indrani and kushpu we are going to today together try and help you get some great insights around coaching and how it can be used for creating transformations in organizations so as gromo revenues we offer icf certifications and all most of you are here have attended our program we also offer marshall goldsmith coaching certifications in india so we are able to beautifully amalgamate these approaches i would say we also offer coaching services where we offer to organizations when they want to hire coaches so we have a panel of coaches who work with us so today's webinar or session is all about creating some learnings for you if you are an a coach you are in for a treat and if you are uh, an organizational development person sitting on the other side of the table a decision maker then you are also in for a treat because we are going to bring some great learnings for all of you so that's about me and let me just quickly introduce you guys to our panelists here who will share their experience with us going forward i have with me renu renu jethani so renu leads hr for sutherland global services serving 25000 employees and brings in 20 years of rich and holistic experience in business partnering building culture leading and nurturing talent across ites media e retail and bfsi in industries so prior to joining sutherland she was associated with the infosys bpo times group godrej group edelweiss group and she has you know, all these you know experiences that transcend the boundaries of the sectors she is a certified coach with 500 plus hours of coaching experience welcome renu and thank you so much for being thank here. you thank you and rajit i am proudly saying i am a gomor avenues product and right. thank you for the kind words i think i'd like to introduce you as uh, you know this is a world of magic and you are this you know special fairy sprinkling the pixie dust transformational of its kind all around today oh and let okay. me welcome indijit as well thank you thank you for your kind words renu okay so i am going to introduce our second panelist uh, which is priya so priya is a group head talent development at ck birla group responsible for leadership capability development at the group level including leadership competency building and succession planning for ceos and cxos so she leads capability linked initiatives on diversity and inclusion besides actively pursuing the build up of enterprise wide leadership academy she is an mbti certified she is an executive coach from coachu australia and icf acc credential holder with 20 plus years of experience so welcome priya to the session thank you so much for the opportunity to share views with this august audience i'm really looking forward to our chat thank welcome. you We are two, and our next panelist is also our esteemed Mr. Saurabh Saurabh Wadwa. Saurabh is executive vice president and head of organizational learning at Kodak Mahindra Bank. A great guy. So Saurabh has over sixteen years of experience in extensive sales training and management development, mostly sales and behavioral side of it. He is a certified coach with five hundred plus hours of coaching experience, and his ex- expertise actually lies in setting up training function. and is experienced in designing training strategy training architecture conducting training need analysis which now is extending into coaching space as well developing training solutions creating road maps and implementation strategies etc so his experience of 500 plus hours of coaching is really worth it he is an icf certified coach as well welcome saurabh thank you thanks lord it's it's pleasure being here I've been a coachy myself before becoming a coach, so I wow. I have seen the benefits of through coaching, and that's the reason I took up this journey of being a coach. Thanks a lot. Wonderful, thank you. So, friends, when we were thinking of you know what kind of people we should invite in our such sessions, we had options, right? We had choices. Some of the choices were you know getting some people from outside India, very senior, experienced people, which sometimes we do. This time we thought we want. to get experienced people from our own country like by high experienced people who are working actually into the space of coaching using it in their in their out for their organizations and uh, so that's how we have these three gen three people like renu priya and saurabh who are working in an organization and they can give us a perspective of uh, how coaching is unfolding in in their organizations and what are the results etc so we'll go into that in a while and i also wanted to bring in another factor of uh, another experience of someone who is on the other side of the table who is somebody who is offering coaching services to organizations so here i have samir in that space samir has 27 plus years of experience and uh, 
was a director of performance excellence in RBS. Now he's a consultant, uh, where he led a global transformation program for India. Prior to that, he was VP and head leadership development, talent management, and OD, again for RBS India. And before that, Samir was a major in the army, where he led his troops in counterinsurgency operations and on the line of control in high altitude in JNK. So he's certified in use of MBTI, Hogan, DISC, EI, and is an ICF certified coach with more than 10,000 hours of facilitation and, and 1,000 hours of coaching experience. So welcome to this webinar. Thank you, Thank you so much, much Imrajit. Uh, good evening, everyone. Really looking forward to the conversation. Thanks. Okay. So friends, what we are going to do is I'm going to put in some questions and ask these panelists, share their thoughts, and we are going to create learnings out of them. So we are going to focus on three or four aspects of coaching. One being how coaching in general is helping organizations, you know, what kind of transformations coaching is bringing in general. That is the first thing that I'd like to focus on. So the conversations are more generic. And then we'll go into how organizations are bringing coaching in them. So taking examples from these three organizations here, Sutherland and CK Bida and Kotak. So what are they doing? What kind of results are they getting, etc. And then we will get into what advice do they have for organizations who want to get into coaching and what advice they have for the coaches who want to sell their services to the, these organizations. So I'm going to start with my first question. And this question is going to be directed to Renu. Renu, are you ready for this? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. So in general, let's say, what in your opinion is the potential of coaching in an organization? I'll start with, you know, my personal experience and then go into how it's, you know, the potential of coaching in the organization. And I've been an accidental coach. You know, every year I take up a course just to sharpen my saw. And, you know, I just took up coaching and just practicing it. And, you know, there was this one person who was looking a little upset. So I said, you know, let's just let me just do some practice with you. And, you know, what happened is just in that one hour of coaching, this person comes back and tells me after a week that I was suicidal and you changed my mind. It was like I was in some wrong content of my mind and you helped me out of it. And he's thankful till today for that just one hour. And that's when I realized the huge potential and magic of coaching. Now, zoom into the organization. And I have seen that, you know, there are a lot of learning and growth interventions, which do help for people who are driven, for people who want it, you know, for people who are, who are great at self-awareness. But there's a set of people, and let me give names to them. Uh, let's call them blissful mediocres who are very happy where they are. You know, we call it law of satisfactory underperformance. And until coaching happens, they don't discover that there's so much of untapped potential that, you know, they didn't know that they need to have a goal, right? Then there are a set of people who are like complainers, right? Who no matter what you do for them, right, bring them all the tools and tactics, but they will discard everything saying, no, this will not work. It's not for me. I think coaching changes something for them. And, and then coming to Sutherland, right? We've been into coaching as well as mentoring for the last seven years. We started with only the CXO level, then came to the leadership, then came to the middle. But now we're trying to build a culture where coaching is into everything we do, right? Our team manager university or first-time managers, etc., is trying to blend in the principles of coaching because it should not be limited to a few. It's not about if you have a problem, you need a coaching. The world's most successful people, you know, the aces in the Olympics and business, they all have coaches, right? I think the, the potential is immense. And I think we, we need loads and loads of coaches around us because we are going to run out of the supply because it's such a magical tool. It gives you much more result than any other kind of intervention. You know, you have maybe deliberately or unconsciously touched upon a very powerful thing here because I am often asked this question every alternate day by people. Every second, third person on LinkedIn is saying I'm a coach. So is there yes. so much of a potential for a coach? And you have really said it that eventually we are going to hit a space where there's lesser supply so because the need is so high, right? So I often tell them, look, you know, having more coaches is a good thing, right? Yep. Because in any ways, there is dearth of good coaches and, and look at any organization like you got 15, 20,000 people in an organization. So literally everybody needs a coach. And coaching is not something which can be, you know, you can like a, put another factory and put another factory. I mean, it's like a, it's like a profession. You have slots, you have hours as a coach, right? You can't do more than three, four sessions a day. 
So we'll need a lot many coaches, and I really agree with that. Thank you, Renu, for bringing that up. Samir, can I hand over the baton to you? Please. So what, in your opinion, is the potential of coaching in an organization? Uh, so I think, see, uh, it's been covered, but at a strategic level, if you ask me, uh, there's loads of potential uh, for two or three reasons. If you look at it at a behavioral level, certainly there is always a need because people get trapped in their mental models, their uh, ways of working, uh, and to sort of unshackle them from those ways of working and mental models always helps break the glass ceiling, build new relationships, uh, relook at their career from a different lens, etc. But even at an organizational level, you know, the whole market environment uh, is changing so rapidly uh, that organizational and market dynamics change very fast. Now, when that changes, it can create a ripple effect within the organization. Now, it's way more complicated today than it was, let's say, 20 years back. Structures, org structures are fluid, unstable, and all of that. And that, you know, that sort of internal ripple effect, if you ask me, from a business lens, when it comes and impacts leaders, it sort of shakes them. And that's where right. coaching can help. Uh, at an organizational level, if you're driving a transformation, and you think it through carefully, and you design it carefully, and you know which wave is going to hit you, let's say, six months, eight months from now, coaching can be designed as an intervention and laid in at the right time with the right set of leaders to, you know, kind of brace up for that impact. And also, you know, creating quick switches, things like growth mindset, one can talk about them. Uh, they sound nice. They are very easy to read. Uh, but growth mindset, for example, requires a huge amount of risk taking, a huge ability to celebrate and forgiveness, new ideas. Now, how do you do that if you're trapped in your past uh, culture so to create a cultural transformation you need to even something as simple as growth mindset go deep within explore culture explore patterns of thinking decision making reward consequence management and all of that at an organizational level can be driven through the process of coaching thank you thank you samir excellent good points you've raised because we always want changes at the behavioral levels which coaching can do People get trapped in their own uh, ways of working, which they want to grow further. They need to change those. Coaching is something which can do that. Also, I think you really mentioned one very powerful point, which is the which is the pace of the change that's happening in the organizations, I would say, right? The change is so fast today that there's no example in the history from there, right? A good experienced leader can share their wisdom, can guide others. But somebody who was experienced 20 years back, his experience is not valid today, right? The change is so fast. So therefore, you need someone who can help you tide over that change. And that's where coaching comes in. Thank you so much. Okay, Saurabh. Thanks, Inderjeet. It's wonderful insights. I'm happy to hear what Renu and Samir contributed. Thank you. I firmly believe that coaching helps people realize their true potential. And that's it starts with that. So if the organization has to realize its true potential, it begins with people because organization is nothing without people. So if people realize their true potential, that's the organization which eventually realizes their true, its true potential. How does coaching supporting us in the organization? I think at, at a cognitive level, I'll tell you is that it does help in succession planning, transitions of leaders, etc., building a culture. However, these are all areas where we use coaches. But I, if I go to a level of an individual, it addresses a core of a mindset challenges that an individual may have. No matter whatever learning interventions you put people through, coaching is the only way where you get people to explore and challenge and find out the, you know, challenge their own mindsets and reflect back and find the ways out by themselves. That's why. And we realize that it also helps them become more empathetic as an outcome, you know. Uh, so we not only today use coaching as a medium, we are, we are as a bank are highly cognitive because we deal with numbers day in, day out. But the moment a coach steps into a conversation, they realize that how they have been able to move by basis those conversations that they have it with coach. And that's how contagious it is that it reflects in the empathy of their conversations with people. So with that, we've taken it to the next level now. We've started an initiative called Managers as Coaches. And we are building a culture of higher EQ in the organization through coaching. 
we are not getting people to be acc certified or icf certified but we are getting people to understand the power of coaching by demonstrating empathy and being non judgmental in their conversations that's how it's contributing while we use in coaching in different areas but i feel that it's also helping us building a culture of empathy in the bank so sorry you really touched upon a, a very different aspect here like because for an organization uh, how they use coaching in their folds and ranks is not necessarily only by hiring coaches also training their managers uh, equipping them with coaching skills that's also a very powerful way of bringing coaching culture in your organization thank you for highlighting that and i like the whole concept of how the organization level coaching is benefiting and how at an individual level it is bringing shifts and i could fully relate with the thing that you said when you said that at bank you deal with numbers right so i've, I've dealt with coach leaders who are very number driven kind of people right and when such people get a coach it's a very different space for them right and and that space helps them really look at life in a very different perspective right get much more clarity about things yeah. so thank you so much for bringing that not only that i'll tell you i'll just add a bit more sure. being cognitive there's nothing wrong with with that because that's what them here yeah. but at this point of time it's helping the leaders to become more vulnerable and yeah. when it become, when the vulnerability comes in i believe it it helps individuals to they become open to learn and collaborate and synergize Absolutely. so that's also what's what we are seeing that as a it's seeping in and people are more vocal about and they become they are becoming self aware in the process so yeah thank you yeah that's really powerful in fact uh, you said oh, there's nothing wrong with cognitive thing which is true because that's how the world runs on that right <laughs> <laughs> that's important part of it but then the other side is important to go so it can bring you to certain level then you need to go beyond that level and there comes in a coach who can help you do so in yeah. fact you said something this has got them here yeah. and that's my favorite line from marshall's book <laughs> what got you here won't get you there Absolutely. right so that's nice way when i talk to leaders tell speak about coaching at all i tell them look whatever has worked for you till till now is not going to get you where you want to go that's why you need a coach absolutely right thank you <laughs> Okay Priya over to you what are your thoughts on this you know i can't really uh, add on any more than uh, what my esteemed colleagues have uh, added to the conversation i would just uh, say that the kind of unlocks coaching is able to create if presented well and placed well and in a timely manner uh, and contextualized so there are there is coaching that is more behaviorally spiked which all of us of course uh naturally gravitate to when there is also you know when you're holding um you know the custody of coaching as a developmental tool for an organization also have to look for what we call business coaches or coaching with a spike in business to really create those unlocks within leaders to help them develop discover and own up different ways of thinking about their problems of you know helping them detach with the constant noise of delivery in their head to really get to what some of the deeper issues are that they could be thinking about and you know my favorite way of describing this is saying we help people move away from um you know a a a, a react decide a uh, model you know I, i react i decide i react i decide to more a respond reflect pivot model and when leaders are doing that at every level it helps to create a whole new language for an organization's culture it helps to create a whole new norms uh, you know of behaving with each other of looking at problem solving of looking at individuals in the capacity of what they bring to the table so there is a role holder and then there is a person in the role and you know we were all talking about it you you have to impact uh, you know the culture from both ends so you work with the person in the role and you also work with the context and coaching helps you to create unlocks at both uh, these ends of the spectrum again with with the caveat that it needs to be positioned well placed well and um, invited and owned you know at the right time within an organization thank you so much i think you really hit this point very well i've been in this space since 2009 and i've seen a lot of organizations trying to use coaching succeeding and in the beginning failing right so having some different experiences and, and then probably that was a little earlier but now everyone is experimenting and happy with it but then so that that brings up the element of uh, and you really said it very well how it is presented how it is placed and how it is timed so these are very important aspects of 
bringing coaching into any organization so i'll move on to my next question and this time my question is we will get into more of uh, you know your own experiences with coaching when you started bringing coaching in your organization what is it that how long you have been using coach so give us some facts and data and details about how long you've been using it what is the process you followed what is what are the difficulties you faced what was easy while doing so what kind of leaders you targeted initially and then went on to uh, other leaders etc so i will will really be happy to know more about that from you guys so i've been dealing with coaching in organizations for nearly 12 to 15 years now uh, you know starting from the point when coaching was this new fad that had just come in and you would only offer it as the absolutest last resort for a for a person typically you know a leader who had kind of plateaued in their role they were doing very well delivering but perhaps had a behavioral concern and so the decision collectively would be coach de dije you know um there were uh, coaches were few and far between you you couldn't get a certified or a credentialed coach at that time so that gray hair conversation that we were having just a few minutes back really held good at that time so you would look at somebody who had kind of retired from a senior role and you would bring those people in however i noticed and this is of course from previous employers i noticed that often there was a lot of resistance to coaching because people felt that it was a very remedial a uh, developmental measure and you know leaders were unable to accept that there was something more that could be unlocked uh, in a conversation with someone and uh, you know they would say there's nothing wrong with me you know so the positioning of coaching at that time versus the positioning of coaching now where you know people are almost taking an entitled view to it saying i am now in role x or y where is my coach you know i have now transitioned into a manager role or i have now become a manager of managers where is my coach so it's been a good journey um but the evolution of coaching from being seen as a purely remedial tool to then being seen as something that can help you understand complex organizational assessments for example you did a 360 you did a leadership circle profile you did a hogan and now you had a coach to help you interpret that report to the pure form of coaching where the coach sits with you holds your agenda for you contextualizes it in the form of your success within the current ecosystem and also takes your own aspirations in mind that pure form of coaching that evolution i have been lucky to see um in my career in ck birla group we really really hold coaching in extremely high esteem as an extremely transformational uh, tool for leadership development we also focus when we gather needs for the leaders or when we discuss groups of people that might benefit from coaching as an intervention we also focus on whether we need more behaviorally oriented coaches or more business oriented coaches Uh, because at the end of the day you know as an organization when you're sponsoring a developmental initiative like this you're really i mean of course you'd like your people to go deep and have those deep inner reflections and come out better people by the end of it but as an organization your agenda really is to ensure that people are also coming out as better professionals at the end of it so you know like it said you're not in the business of making good human beings out of people only you know you're also in the business of making good professionals who will contribute to business results so at the get go identifying whether a business spiked coach which will help leaders like i said before think about different ways of thinking think about scoping problems or understanding problems in a different way think about responses rather than reactions to what they are hearing help them detach themselves from the noise of achievement always to really dig deeper into um what are more innate tools that they already have some of that um, we assess and then the second um, important thing is we allow the coachee to shape their agenda in the coaching conversation so of course there's an imperative that the organization will say now you're at x level or y level or now you're a ceo and you know these are the things you should be thinking about of course that forms part of the coaching agenda but unless the leader comes into the coaching relationship with their own agenda and with their own aspirations the success of that relationship can get compromised so we are very mindful to build these things in um into coaching relationships we have used coaching as integral part of longer leadership development journeys more cohort based experiences two more individualized experiences for people who are going through role transitions for example or are just mm, struggling with a certain aspect uh, of their leadership so we've used it uh, in both ways at ck bella group so thanks priya so i i mean i think what will benefit us more is if you could uh, reveal 
certain things about your successes and your challenges around when you started implementing coaching you know some data some facts it might be useful for the audience here if it's possible let me let me say this coaching is almost a uh, 100% um, you know available or 100% i can say of our ceos and the cxo uh, layers will receive a coach at some time uh, in their role a uh, coaching is clear and a uh, Uh, and a very well anchored part of all of the leadership development interventions we do for selected cohorts so okay. there is um, you know i can present the data in this way that 100% of all our leadership development cohorts will have five or more sessions of coaching for each individual 100% of our cxos and ceos will experience coaching at some time uh, you know in their role so that's the kind of trust we have on coaching in a previous organization that i worked for and um, i'm taking saurabh's uh, sort of thought further here we also um had this whole initiative around uh, managers at, uh, as coaches and we were pushing them into icf accreditations saying if you have to do this you have to do this well if okay. icf uh, credit credentials you and says you're a coach then you're a good enough coach for the organization and we were doing it you know in pockets of the organization so sure. uh, that's where it's at so do you have in house coaches you hire external coaches no at ck builder group we partner with external coaches external coaches yeah. and how do you measure the results from coaching i mean is there a metrics is there a way or you know you let the coach and the client be working together what's the thought process on that this is a very interesting question and we debate it almost every year in every leader forum that, that we sit uh, sit at because you know what is the roi right. uh, of a purely behaviorally centered intervention i find that question very difficult to answer I I agree with you it's 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 very different very subjective okay yeah so um i measure the coach and coachee to me the markers of a successful coaching how available they are how much do they follow through on what has been discussed and how open they are to dis- you know how much do they bring into the coaching session this is a report that i seek from my coaches after every coaching session so there's typically five or six coaching sessions minimum for individuals whether they are part of a structured journey or outside of it and i seek this report after every session so you know markers like are coachi to session nahi set karta hai or you know uh, we set up an hour session and they are only available for about half an hour those to me are markers of how this intervention is impacting people we have also gone ahead and withdrawn coaching from a few individuals who just could not see the benefit of it or who were struggling to bring in something constructive into the coaching conversation we have the same check in with the coachee as well on how well do they think they have progressed on the development agenda that they set for this themselves um human development is very asynchronous some people will start showing results within 3 4 months and some people will take you know more Long than 18 yeah. to 20 months for that you know bulb to really glow and for something significant to happen that you can observe but year on year in terms of business results um any deltas that we see we find them encouraging i am not in favor of you know associating them 100% back to the coaching that they receive because there's a multitude of development experiences that a person goes through so i am not a great person to answer this roi question for you but you you have answered it very uniquely and i really appreciate that because it's it's really a very gray area i mean there are different models of measuring roi and each works in in certain contexts right but this is really nice i really appreciate and like this approach because coaching by virtue of its nature is everything is confidential right, right. so you really cannot reveal what is happening with the client but if there was a way to measure whether the sessions are really happening or not uh, during the conversation is the coachy more open and is the coachy really working on the actions he or she is committed you know this is really powerful because this is something if a coach is sharing with you also it's not is not infringing upon the no. any kind of ethical issues or confidentiality no. issue and and that also keeps the leader whom you are coaching uh, when he knows that this is going to be shared he he is also quite prompt in working on those areas because change is not easy group of coaches i can also share that you know when i work with coaches and i tell them that this is what i need to know sometimes you know there is that it it can get into the gray area of saying oh we decided to work on this but it went into this and i tell them i don't need to know i do not want to know what you decided to work on exactly i want to know how much of that work is happening how much commitment are you seeing session on session so when i uphold the confidentiality of the coach coachy agenda the coach upholds it as well and that's kind of thank something you. that we really emphasize thank you priya sir tell us more about how coaching is unfolding at uh, in your organization some facts details data 
whatever so i agree with when we started with coaching about 3 years ago in our organizational context we realized that people used to perceive this as a remedial the first thing they would ask is that what is the problem do you foresee in me why am i getting a coach where is the problem right. so it's always been that they feel that it's a patient who needs a doctor and i am a patient and that is why i'm given a coach so right. there's something wrong with me and that's yeah. how i agree with that's the first mindset the second challenge that i've seen is that most leaders they they would not be able to distinct between a coach and a mentor they would say that looks if you getting me a coach get me somebody who's an experienced banker who's handled those businesses who can guide me through how do i do certain ways and in my you know business strategy in terms of achieving my 10x growth in business etc so it took us a while for help them to understand to do a 10x at business first the focus has to be on you so it's it has to be not onto the business but onto you first that's where the coach steps in and a coach not necessarily needs to be a domain or a functional expert so that's a shift that happened over a period of time and then we it took us a while to help people realize that coaching is hyper personalized and at the top of the pyramid of de- any developmental journey for people because it's hyper personalized you can't afford to do it otherwise and you're given it's a privilege to do it so that's a, another shift that we do it from a remedial to make them believe that it's a matter of pride to have a coach so that's another shift and then the mentor to a coach that's another shift that we bought and now we see that there's far more acceptance and openness to have a coach you know and people look forward to and there are now cases when people are asking am i going to get a coach or not tell me so <laughs> because then i'm considered to be a high potential and people believe me that i'm going to be a future leader in the bank so that's how it's been been able to move that i think in terms of roi i would say uh, we always start with uh, creating an idp and similar to what pia also said that understand that and we carry out a 360 degree we do strength finder we we also use few assessments to understand and then all that looking at that we we possibly get a coach to work with that and there's a tried conversation in terms of return on investment i would see we clearly see that the engagement scores going up within the teams when the coaches because it's you know obviously higher the better engaged people are the higher the productivity is and higher the productivity the better business outcomes that you can see so these are means to achieve the end but we can we pin down and say that what is the return on investment it's too early for us to say that right now thank you so much i appreciate that i have worked with organizations where they are very open they say well for us we are really not in it we we have understood what coaching is it's more like offering uh, our leaders uh, a space to unfold and come out with whatever they want to so certain organizations have worked with they are okay to not measure it they say well we provide a coach to the leader and let the let them uh, you know get the benefits of that right in any case the leader is going to become better so depends organization to organization it varies so agree. thank you saurabh thank you so much thank you reenu i completely agree with saurabh and priya and i think we have faced similar set of challenges and came up i think one thing that we do now well is you know starting from cxo level and all we are an organization with level 1 to 10 and now f- level 5 to level 10 all of them go through coaching uh, level 5 and 6 have a blended module of mentoring and coaching because they also want a lot of advising and they want domain experts to come in so we cover that we have 500 people getting coached every year and you know grow more avenues is also another vendor partner coming specifically to measurability we have a part of kirkpatrick model deployed here so first thing is the coverage and that is you know all the high posts should get covered but we don't force fit it because everybody has a different will and us so what we do is while we when we identify so called brave hearts who go for coaching we do a buy in session where everyone who's benefited from these sessions come and tell their experiences and that's the starting point for us right that's helped us create that buy in within the system but to talk about numbers is one is the participation level the second is you know how's the immediate feedback and reaction like for example you know for grow more we had a, a enps score of 96 from the folks they were really happy with the kind of coaching they experienced immediately after the intervention then we looked at you know 
specific because each of these intervention, you know, whether it's a two month sprint or a six month transformational saga into coaching starts with a goal. So we look at that immediate goal achievement. We also look at how the behavior has changed. I would be very happy to share that as an organizational employee net promoter score is at a 63, but the leaders who've undergone coaching their averages at around 75, right? So we clearly see, and that translates also into a higher CNPS. It also helps retention of these leaders. So the leaders who've undergone coaching again with us have an average tenure of nine years with the organization, which means if they are on a self-development journey within the organization, we get the best of their talent and abilities. And they also try to retain everyone around, around them. So their own goals on retention, on top line, on bot bottom line, and the whole ripple effect, right? is tremendous. I think we benefit really, really strongly. And we are constantly looking at, you know, enhancing this. The only challenging in, you know, zooming and expanding this intervention is we cannot have a coach within the organization, right? Because coach has to be non-judgmental and organization tends to be judgmental in assessing you, right? So that's one, one area which is not, you know, the number remains like 500 in a year, but it's been an amazing journey for us for the last seven years. That's really nice. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, Samir, how do you think you can contribute to this? You Do you want to relate to your experience when you were in a corporate job? Sure, uh, Indrajit. I think just uh, two very quick points. When I took over my role of a talent lead head about 10 years back, I realized coaching was happening, but there was no uh, way of measuring the impact or even experiencing it, talking about it in any way. And at that point in time, I had introduced a three-way call between, let's say, the CEO, the business head, and the coach. Uh, the reason was the leader was coming back and saying, yeah, you're taking so much money, where is it going? I'm not seeing a change. And uh, while I did not argue with him and say that that's your problem, uh, I tried <laughs> to think of a way to figure, to create an answer for that. So I thought the best way to do that is through a three-way call where three adults can talk and figure out, well, what do you want to work on? There is no shame in discussing that. And it builds clarity. That is the context in which the leader operates. That is the context in which the, even the coach needs to know what kind of a leader my coach he works with. So there are two things that at least I have done. One is this three-way conversation at the start and the, at the end of uh, the journey. Uh, you needn't share confidential stuff, but if you can't even share what you have done, and this is the dialogue I have with the leader, then there is a serious problem. You know, if you if you can't build that trust and that dialogue with your current line manager, there is a serious problem, you know, career challenge that you'll face. So grow up and have that three-way conversation at the beginning and the end and keep the confidential parts out. Nobody wants to know that in any case. The other one uh, was, you know, in my consulting after one of these CEOs again said that you take so much money. It's a, I don't believe in all this. It's a waste of money. But yeah, sure, I have to invest. Uh, and being a little pig-headed, I said, okay, let's talk about your balance scorecard and let's see what are the numbers you want to drive. And then because behaviors lead to results, it's quite simple. And we'll prove it to you. Let's have a dialogue using yeah. that. And let's then look at the underlying behaviors, whether they're around trust, collaboration, breaking silos, demonstrating agility. In the end, it comes down to some key uh, behaviors. Once you start exploring the behaviors, which is what a coach does, and you might come across fear, passion, ambition, hesitation, blah, 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 all of that stuff. And you get it right. You can then help the coach, the leader, start pivoting around that. And the moment they start they get it and they act on it, you know, the scores start changing. And that's what Kirkpatrick says. And, you know, we all know from experience. So uh, this was a case where I said, okay, let's start with the business scorecard. We are all adults and uh, let's look at how we can impact that and uh, explore that as leaders. The third where I have done a cohort and I just did this, closed this journey a month, two months back, uh, was a small cohort of six leaders, getting them into a closing kind of a session together uh, and the idea was for them to exchange stories and see how far they can be vulnerable with these leaders and share things that they think they have worked on and to cross pollinate and uh, sort of you know inspire other leaders within that cohort to do things uh, differently so closure could be at multiple levels in multiple ways, it could be explicit, it could be through a story, it could be through a dialogue. But if you ask me, uh, figuring out that method is a very important question for us. 
Uh, yeah. And if the client hasn't figured it out, then as consultants, advisors, we need to nudge them and help them figure out how we will do that. In fact, one of these business leaders came and said that you all made us do the three-way conversation and it made me feel so accountable. I really had to do some homework to make sense in that three-way conversation. I couldn't faff my way through. These were his words, uh, CEO. To me, that was amazing because it immediately builds a responsibility and skin in the game from the business side. Absolutely. So there are so many facets of the whole thing, right? And right approach for the right client in the right way. What are the results? But I believe that these things should be clear in the beginning as you start the intervention, right? And one of the questions that I, I've always wanted to ask people who are the decision makers for getting coaches in their organizations has been, uh, what is their criteria? Like, what is it that you look for in a coach? So thoughts from Renu, Priya, Saurabh, what are your criteria? How do you, you know, identify a right coach? Is it the coach experience? Like sort of you mentioned earlier, you, you know, they wanted a banker, coach with a banking background, stuff like that. To what extent all these things play a role? Certifications, are they ICF certified or not? You know, what are your thoughts on these? Sort of, would you like to answer that question first? In the Jeet, the only I'm only skeptical that when we have to work with you, you are asking me to relieve that secret recipe that what do you look in a coach to? <laughs> Uh, we are, we are, we are yeah. smart marketers, right? So we brought you here <laughs> to get your strategy and then pitch back to you, to you. Let me tell you one is that most importantly, I tell you, and I go back to what Renu suggested, it's they need to be non-judgmental at all times in the conversations. And okay. their ability to connect at a emotional level with people is very important because I see uh, a lot of coaches honestly are very, very logical, very, very analytical, but they lack in their EQ themselves. Well, they understand the fundamentals of coaching, but sometimes I've seen that coaches are not able to touch the right feeling cord with the coachee, which can move things. So the empathy part of it and the connect part of it is extremely important for me when I look at a coach. They need to be non-judgmental, as I said. And absolutely, the core value of a coach, I believe, is that they believe in goodness of people. So if you if you have biases around that bankers are such or they have you have right. caste biases or a religion biases or a gender biases, and I check on that specifically, that do they come with any kind of biases, believe me, then I rule out them completely. So these are few things that I look at. I don't necessarily look at their domain experience because that's what we've been able to make people understand in the ecosystem at leadership level that don't expect that they are the mentors and they don't come with experience of being, you know, done that. So don't look at that. All these meetings is the poise that they bring in, the, their empathy and listening, and also most importantly, their ability to ask exploratory questions is very very important is how do you get people to explore within themselves what the true and get them to reflect is very important so these are few things i'm sorry but i you got to got me to open up the recipe that i looked at <laughs> <laughs> you send me some coaches you know what i'm going to look at now <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you so much Hello. thank you yeah. Priya? We do much the same. Uh, I would agree with almost everything Saurabh said. Coach selection is very contextual to the kind of coaches you have in mind, what they need and what would work for them. The last thing I look for is uh, really domain knowledge or functional knowledge, although in some cases it helps to establish the credibility of the coach, although you know we are in no way uh, using the coach uh, in any mentoring sort of capacity, similar to what Saurabh said. I also focus uh, these days a lot on looking for an ICF credential because I very recently went through the credentialing process and it requires a lot of rigor and discipline. And so it gives me comfort that if somebody has gone through that level of rigor and discipline and, you know, has reached here, I, there is a certain confidence that I will carry in them being able to utilize, apply the ICF competencies, which I, which I endorse. Also, I do personal interviews with all of the coaches, again, to understand some of these things, you know, how, how articulate they are, how open they are, how they present their views, what is their coaching philosophy, what do they feel about people in general. And I also try to assess, of course, as all of us who are custodians of these relationships, whether they would be a good fit with either this level of people or this kind of person, depending on who I have in mind. 
you know, somebody with very urban habits, a very urban presentation, coaching somebody who works in a very remote plant. I don't know how that, you know, whether that trust building will take longer or not. So these are the smaller things that you look at. But the main thing I would look for is a credential, is the openness of the coach. And also what is the spike that they bring in? So when they talk about creating transformations in people, do they, do they talk about creating transformations in terms of their business delivery, in terms of their numbers, in terms of making them a better leader? Or are they more focused on helping the person look within, you know, uh, get something out of their own inner reflections, transform their way of thinking and relating to the world? Because both are important to me on a certain side of the spectrum. Those are the things that I would look for. And of course, absolutely 100% a person who is non-judgmental. Thank you so much for saying that. I have missed one question to both of you, Priya and Saurabh. Does a coach's prior experience, coaching experience, has any sway, any weightage? Ruth, carry weightage for you. Coach who has been coaching for three years, five years versus coach who just started coaching one year back. For me, it would have, depending on the level of leader that they are coaching. Because again, it's to help the relationship start off on a good foot. And sometimes coaches have these uh, reservations. Uh, You know, I had a very senior leader in a CXO position who resisted uh, the coach because they said they haven't coached any such CXOs before, you know, or they haven't been a CXO in any organization. So how would they know what my challenges are? So, you know, just to help the relationship start off on a good foot, sometimes I would look at a certain base level of uh, experience. So my answer to that, Priya, largely is that, of course, we keep the coachy persona in mind when we decide on a coach. Yeah. I think it's important because sometimes it's the experience that matters because that's how you can relate to. But if you would expect uh, somebody to be a domain expert and if somebody is a non-BFSI professional and still be a coach, but having a great experience at leadership levels, we do consider them. But when I am meeting up a coach I'm always keeping the coachy at the back of my mind that if this is my coachy, that's what Priya is saying too. Yeah. Yeah. So, sort of, my question had little different connotation, not the domain experience, coaching experience. Does yeah. that play any role? I'll also tell you honestly, Indrajit, is I have seen coaches with years of experience and still not able to make a cut with me. And I've yeah. seen coaches who have their innate abilities of being, you know, amazingly compassionate and ability to connect with people and then coach certified and only being a coach for one year, I think they have sailed through seamlessly with me. Wonderful. So it's a lot to do with what values do you bring on to table sometimes and people, you know, uh, these days it's because it's the in thing everybody is going for ACC and, you know, become an ICF certified. But to be a coach is to work at yourself at a very deeper level as well. Sometimes it's about changing your own value system as well. Okay. So your answer is that it's not a major criteria. Like if someone uh, has four years of a coaching experience and someone has one year, you are open to, I mean, your criteria are different, right? I don't want to be a stereotype, but I'll still tell you, I've seen a lot of women coaches to be better than men coaches because of their natural compassionate, <laughs> you know, the, the, the nature of compassion and empathy that they bring on to table. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Saurabh. But I also want to answer Renu what she said that, you know, using internal people as coaches. So we in a bank have an advantage of scale. Today, when we certify manager as coaches, we do not want managers to start coaching their team members first. We're creating a micro site where they are certified coaches And there are coaches on the other side who want coaches and they organize a set meetings by themselves. And that's not my team member. The advantage of scale help us bring that. And that's absolutely non-judgmental because you don't know the other individual there. Wow, that's a great idea. And I'm going to take that back, Saurabh. Thank you, Rin. (laughs) All right, that's really powerful. Yeah. Indrajit, a quick answer to that one is that we start with a minimum threshold, like minimum 100 hours of coaching and you know, coaching persona, but I think the winning formula is, you know, the spark that person brings and that's judged by, you know, how much they have researched, let's say if if it's for a coach or for the organization, how much they have tried to know about, you know, the the cultural context, what they do, etc. And at the same time, how much they love coaching per se, which comes out in the conversation. If that's there, you know, they're good. So 100 hours of coaching minimum, how much they love coaching from their conversations, you are able to assess 
how good a coach they are right yep yep it's a great point you bring in renu and i'm reminded of this really um senior person who is a coach and perhaps would have met all of us who came into a conversation you know i was evaluating their fit for a certain coaching engagement they did not ask me even one question in a 30 minute conversation and so you know they didn't cut make the cut for that particular engagement because you're a coach and if you are not curious you don't ask me even one question then that doesn't give me confidence of you know you're being a good fit with but of course with due respect to their credential which was a high credential and their many uh, years of uh, coaching but there are some of those things become then deal breakers oh, thank you i am honestly walking away with the two powerful words one from priya spike and from, one from renu spark <laughs> i'll add one more authenticity yeah. i think authenticity. that's that's a deal I think, i think that will i'll associate with more with sorov right <laughs> yeah thank you so samir uh, because you are not in the in an organization hiring coaches but then you are a consultant so what are your thoughts on that you know i think authenticity is key yeah uh, you need to be passionate about it it's a complex intervention it's not easy it's not a straight line you know and this i'm saying because you can be outside the room and say and i've heard people say are what's the big deal here questions puchna you know you just have to listen but no you have to go beyond listening and uh, you have to prepare so i and my team we we pick up cases we discuss them we discuss the difficult cases mm-hmm. uh, we pre plan for these cases to really understand who is the participant here what is the best approach where is the organization in all of this how many steps like we are saying some might you know just embrace it whole hog and you know make the most of six sessions some might take just five sessions to get somewhere mm-hmm. and that's fine for them okay i think our ability to handle our own anxiety is more important in a coaching intervention our ability to be authentic mm-hmm. our ability to be deeply empathetic and immersed in the client's perspective without judgment bias or the keenness to arrive at an answer is absolutely critical mm-hmm. uh, how do you assess for that you know when i was on the other side i would set up a 30 minute call or maybe more with all the coaches and ask them to share a couple of stories of you know what happened what worked what didn't work what was your approach and the stories give you a clue into you know the thinking of the coach the approach that they take not really a behavioral cbi competency based interview or something right but yeah just one or two stories tell you how does the thinking work which is what you want to know right so samir uh, you are working as coach to a lot of clients and uh, you must have first time met the clients right you must have gone through the process of selection we're trying to help the audience here like what should a coach have when they are approaching organizations right so we got some some understandings from other three people over here saurabh and uh, priya and renu that they should be non judgmental be able to connect and you are also saying your thinking process matters don't bring biases what what else if anything you want to share on that what would help them land well get the job uh, if you ask me and i'll just be honest because you said all these people on the call might benefit from it i think it is the number of hours and what i mean is not by you know like 100 hours 200 hours 500 hours and getting to 500 hours So it's not the number of hours that matter mm-hmm. uh, but how deeply you have steeped yourself in the experience of those hours and how far you have driven yourself with a growth mindset to be building those skill sets of empathy of of listening of uh, curiosity of walking the path with the client of holding on to that temptation uh, to give a suggestion or try and you know push for an answer to to help the coach get somewhere So it's definitely the number of hours the credentials do help uh, there are so many coaches out there uh, there is no kind of a distinguishing factor between a and b certainly being an engineer being an mba and all of that helps and i say that because i'm none i'm not an engineer i'm not an mba right uh, but folks who have that it definitely helps it's about right. how you can showcase and market yourself but that you know runs out of steam very quickly i must tell you because coaching itself is such a subtle skill uh, you can get one assignment you can get work with one client uh, but if you haven't invested in the art of coaching i can guarantee they'll not call you back because okay. you're dealing at the highest level right in a complex skill in a very very tricky 
you know, space because there is power, politics, ambition, glass wall, ceiling, top talent, nine box, everything also works. That's also a reality. In that I, reality, you have to be competent to move the needle. No, no, I appreciate. So, so what I'm getting from you is that while certification and number of hours can get your foot in the door, but the real skill, I mean, if you don't have it, then obviously you are not uh, there for a long term kind of a space, right? You probably will fizzle out faster. Yeah. Yeah. So it's sorry. Go ahead. Baby. Yeah, no, I, I'd like to add is that, you know, as coaches, sometimes we know don't have a great sense of reality. We're so immersed into wanting to help the other person. We don't know we are being a good coach or a bad coach. Did we ask that question right? That's why I would say results and testimonials. If you've done your job really well, it will show in the result. It will show in the goal accomplishment. It will show in, you know, people coming out of that dark forces of doubt within their mind or, you know, tapping into their superpowers. And you know, I look at numbers and results. Okay, that's great. So I think number and results from where you are saying coming is, Renu, what kind of clients you have worked with, what results, what kind of transformation. What kind of about. testimonials they have to say about. Absolutely. But then what Samir is highlighting is that number of hours are important. But if you have not done good job in those number of hours of practice, you are not becoming a good coach. Right. So that's the key. And, and, and I believe that if you are really not a good coach, you don't have that depth in your coaching, you will never get through at least Renu, Priya and Saurabh, that I know for sure. Right? <laughs> so you need to have, have depth in your coaching. And the people on the other side of the table, and I'm really happy and glad to know this, that decision makers are fully competent. They are quite aware of what coaching is. right? So you can't really fool them. You can't really you know, put a facade. They will see through that. So therefore, <laughs> as a good coach, it's a good idea to invest in yourself, keep learning and evolving. And, and then being a good coach will work for you. Having said that, Indrajit, I must also say that a lot of our evaluation methods are not 100% objective as anything that deals with human beings cannot be 100% objective. So there is a there is an element of subjectivity we bring in even when, when we are selecting coaches, even though we are doing it with the best of our intent and with the best interests of the coachee in mind. There are instances when those relationships don't work out as we had intended when you know the progress is not as uh, dramatic as uh, we had expected. So we learn. Because some of these are also biases in the positive direction that we hold, that a certain number of hours will guarantee something or a, you know, yeah, yeah. That a certain credential will guarantee something. So, you know, like Samir very eloquently said, we all need to invest in ourselves as business leaders, as coaches, as people who work with coaches. So there's no 100% foolproof formula, you know, to get the right fit uh, every time. Thank you. I appreciate If, if I may Thanks. just add, Indrajit, uh, for the benefit of the group, I think, if you really seriously want into to get into the space of coaching and make it into a you know a career i think working with peers identifying those one or two peers colleagues friends whatever you may call it is very important to work with them and whenever you feel see you'll intuitively feel that you know it worked it didn't work it is very important at that point in time to be vulnerable get into that trusting circle and say you know this is what it is. Maybe I'm not getting it because it's complex. The human mind is very complex. And what that can lead to is it can create self-doubt and it can just mess up your follow-up sessions because then you are carrying self-doubt into the next session. Am I doing the right thing? Uh, and I can honestly admit over here, uh, I've had chats with Gaurima. She's heard my uh, recordings and, you know, and I've had to be very, very humble, step back, listen to her. We've had our own discussion around, you know, how does this work, that work, how right. else can it work, etc. So use that opportunity that will help you build that muscle as much as you can. True, true. Being humble is very important for every coach. And I fully agree with that. Thank you, Samir. That was Indeed, a nice I just want to say one thing. Yes. So what I want to highlight is that what Samir said is answering the question that to lead transformation in individual and organizations so coach and training has to go through a lot of transformation so right. that is somewhere uh, truly so to be able to highlight. to be able to cut the iron you got to harden yourself first right so you need to transform yourself and then you are able to create those transformation for others that's really powerful i mean we are almost done i mean i am run out of my questions and i'm really happy we created some learnings for all of us Saurabh, were you trying to say something just that i i just wanted to add to everybody what they said is that when we especially oh, no. look at coach and when we say that it's it's not the experience i think we we also operate out of those biases at times the gray hair the experience and all that so 
when a coach meets up another coach to see how good they are then you always also start with it being non judgmental <laughs> to begin with <laughs> right right thank you i appreciate that okay this is nice so friends i think that is it from our side thank you so much i like to as we close for the day i hope i have answered all the questions that people have asked any one of you has want to unmute and ask a question i am we can take one more question good evening in the jeep subroto yes yeah. so first and foremost uh, you know thank you very much for organizing this uh, webinar and uh, such a enlightened uh, panel i say so because you know they're all certified coaches and we could you know very well understand that they're people with a lot of understanding of what coaching comes from so so typically we have you know two types of coaching which i understand and i call it coach on demand and coach on tap right so co- coach on demand is when you you know engage a coach for a specific business issue kind of a thing you, know? <laughs> you want a specific issue to be sorted out within a specific span of time and the coach on tap are coaches where more or less they go into the cxo level where it's more of a reflective sounding board for growth and it's a it's a longer kind of an engagement it's ongoing especially if the chemistry matches and then it goes on however two questions i want to put to the group one is you know you had asked a part of it as to how they select etc so one is how do you get a ringside view as to who are the coaches in the market because my experience is nearly 50% of the hr people don't respond to a linkedin request to connect or you know because they're all worried my you know in mail is going to get jammed with requests etc so that's a protective mechanism so how do you how do you judge as to what is the new talent coming in or what is available in the market or is it only that know who small pool of uh, you know the same uh, coaches which you see every day so, that is subroto just for want of time uh, i i got your question and it's a very good question for the audience over here and i'm going to invite one of you renu priya and saurabh to answer how as a new coach who is not in your environment in your circle how does he he approach you like how do you let do you let some new people come in your circle if you do what's your criteria how do you really any thoughts on this priya renu saurabh so how i do this is that i do attend networking events where i'm likely to meet new coaches i am always very open to meeting newer coaches i depend a lot also on word of mouth for people that i trust uh, and i don't only ask around in hr circles i also ask around in business circles because people have been transformed through receiving coaching and sometimes they will recommend those coaches and okay. the third and the most stable way of uh, getting new coaches in is i work with people that empanel coaches so i will work I with see. organizations that have a pool of coaches already empaneled uh, but of course you know i meet all of them and you know that's how the the list kind of grows but uh, you know if if you're working with a trusted partner you will know that they will have a set of already evaluated you know it, good yeah. quality uh, people on board so those are the okay. three ways that i use yeah so uh, then we are saying that linkedin is not really very effective right i do um, uh, you know accept requests on linkedin i go through people's profiles i see what they share and i connect uh, also personally Right. So, so I connected with Indrani uh, as well and yourself at one of the forums, right? Right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I, oh yes, I can vouch for that. So Priya, after we met at the ICF country, we did yeah. connect. So yes. Yeah. yeah. So so friends, what a uh, uh, that's nice. Saurabh and uh, Renu, you want to say something? Uh, I'll say plus one Priya and uh, in panel coaches. You know, it is coaching as a word is so misused and overused, and True. people don't really know the real context of this coaching that we're talking about. So it's still still a struggle and still trying to find find solutions. wonderful okay sorps plus 1 nine absolutely so we depend on trusted partners like you excellent so that means for the all the coaches out here become part of an impaneled organization go out on networking meetings events and uh, try to create some testimonials which will create some word of mouth for you right sorps thank you so much for that was a great question we just got one more minute in the anup here uh, so Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so this Pardon. is more from an organization point of view. So my question uh, to all the panelists is: quite at times you must have come across situation where a supervisor is also wanting to know what happened in a coaching session. Okay. How how do you handle that? That's one. Second is there is a very thin line of using the word coaching in KPO, BPO industry, and in IT industry, and and you know where we all are, right? Plus mentoring. 
how do you set the expectations right in the beginning what, what is the process that you put in place to build those okay. expectations Anup, this is again well, let me quickly answer that indrajit if you okay, will allow 30 seconds Sara, if you want to leave please feel thank free thank you please. thanks a lot it was thank you so much for being here meeting with you you all are wonderful yeah. people i had a um, so yeah, we built for this um sorry i i don't didn't Bye, get sorry. the name because it says webinar participant um, but, um, um, Aru, Anu, okay. Yeah. So what we do is the manager is involved at least at two distinct points during the coaching journey. First is at the beginning when they will input into the development goals, and we typically do that through a three hundred and sixty. And you know, we also ask for any feedback that they share during the performance cycle. Towards the end of the coaching engagement, we organize a tripartite, tripartite discussion. These two at these two points, we definitely involve the manager. But depending again on the context in which coaching is offered, sometimes we do that in the middle of the coaching engagement as well. so get together on a tripartite because eventually uh, you know although it is extremely confidential what the coach and coachee are discussing and what they are planning towards half the time coachee's issues are also related to their managers especially if you are working with lower middle management or, uh, or middle management so this handing off of the baton to the manager to say okay i am working on these five things and i will need your support to continue to work at this in the presence of either the coaching sponsor or the coach themselves depending on the context those are distinct points at which we involve the manager okay. just to add just to add we have a sponsor brief from the manager manager has to be the sponsor and has to take accountability to make the coachy successful throughout uh, rest the process is same plus one to priya all right thank you friends uh, i think that is it thank you anup for that was a good question any more questions we probably look forward to answering them in our next webinar thank you everyone Hi Ambuj. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you Renu and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Priya. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye